Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here so early in the morning. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about verified employment data. Before I start, let me ask you a question. So how many of you have purchased a car and have taken an auto loan to finance the purchase? OK, thank you. I see many, many hands. Now I'm going to ask a different question, perhaps more difficult and a bit personal. So how many have applied for a car loan but got denied? No takers on that, as expected. So why do I ask that question? The reason is it's important for this talk to keep in mind the, the audience, the respondent I'm talking about in this paper is very different from the audience that we have here. So it's important to keep in mind that not all Americans will be living in like more financial freedom as uh, as very privileged group. Okay, so with that, I'm going to talk about what is the value of having a verified employment data in consumer lending. I'd like to start by acknowledging my amazing collaborators in this project. Ted Chen is a professor of marketing at Washington University in St. Louis. He is the most amazing advisor one can wish for. Narsai Hamdi is a senior VP of marketing and uh, analytics at Equifax. Uh, fun facts on Nasser, he had a PhD in bioengineering, and then he, was, he used to be a tenured professor in bioengineering before quitting and joining the business world. And last but not the least, uh, Xiang Hui is assistant professor of marketing also at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Okay, so as we all know, when consumers are making a large purchase, such as buying a car, Typically, we apply for a loan. And then the most typical solution in the lending market for lenders is to use credit scoring. So they check your credit score, and if you have a good score, then off you go, you get a loan, you make the purchase. However, accessing the credit market is not so easy for many Americans. There are 45 million Americans who don't have a credit score. This happens when consumers don't have an established credit history. They don't have a credit card, mortgage, or auto loan. And it's hard to get started. And for the remaining 100 million con uh, consumers in the US, it's estimated that about uh, anywhere from a third to a half of them would belong to the more subprime category. So when they don't have a great credit score uh, to access the credit market. So then what's the issue here? You have this large population of consumers that when they need to make a large purchase, it's hard to access the credit market to fund those purchases. And not only is it an issue for consumers and because of the vast number of consumers, that becomes a societal problem. On the other hand, for lenders, this also can have a limited market potential if lenders can only lend to consumers who have a prime credit score, then that really limits to what the customer base they can reach. So given those issues, lenders have been thinking, okay, what else do I, can, I, can I have other than just the credit scoring? So what other things can I utilize to assess, uh, is this consumer likely to make payment or not? Right, income, so how much money you make. So because of the importance of employment and income in assessing consumers' ability to pay, then it's very common for lenders to request self-reported income information. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have seen something like this before. At a dealership, they're going to ask you to fill some paperwork to file for an auto loan. In addition to your personal information, they're going to want to ask uh, what is your employer? Uh, what do you do? What's your occupation? How long have you been working there? And what's your, what's your monthly income? And with that, they're going to have a better sense of your ability to pay in addition to your credit score. Isn't it a good question? Uh, I mean, isn't this part of the credit score? I mean, maybe I was, my understanding is incomplete. But is this, does this feed into the credit score as well? The That's a 
Good, uh, that's a great question. Income is not included in credit scoring. Okay. Credit score is entirely based on your previous credit history. It's on all the loans you have taken. It's on your payment on the loan. But your income, your occupation, and a lot of other range of demographic information is not allowed on the credit scoring. Good question. OK, so with that, what's the issue here for lenders? Self-reported. Yeah. People lie. Right. People lie. <laughs> People lie. And it's going to be hard to verify such information. And you can imagine for consumers who think you know, they may have difficulty accessing the loan, then they have every incentive to inflate that number. And it's going to be hard for lenders to really just verify the accuracy of the information. They have several options. They can um, make contact to the HR department of the employer. And they're, I guess, obligated to report, but then that can take a long time. They can ask uh, the consumers to go back home and uh, give their pay stub or tax form. But then most of the loan application happens at a dealership. And then the last thing dealers want is for you to walk out that door and go home and you know, collect paperwork. You know, nobody's going to come back. So because of that, that's, even though the information is valuable, but collecting so is really challenging. So what do we do here in this project is to evaluate what's the impact of having a digital verification of the employment income. I'll talk about exactly how this digital verification work on the next slide, but just as a preview of what we find, we find that when consumers have access to this digital employment verification, they have a large increase in their chance of getting an auto loan. There's 35% 35, uh, 35 increase in the consumer's chance of accessing a loan, and the effect is most significant for consumers who are more on the lower credit segment. What happens to lenders? We show that lenders also enjoy a large 20% increase in their profit. And this happens because this market expansion effect, the ability for them to lend to a larger pool of consumers dominate the cost that comes from a higher delinquency from this expanded consumer. Any questions so far? OK. So how does this digital employment verification work? Consumer apply for a loan, and then lenders can choose to submit this verification request for employment information. They do so submit it to Equifax, and Equifax is acting as a platform or intermediary. And then a range of participating employers will submit their employment record to Equifax on a monthly basis. And then Equifax is going to fulfill those employment requests on behalf of the employers. And then the request, the, the response to that can come in either of the two forms. So if the uh, inquired consumer is on the database, then it's, they're going to return the employment information, the income, the tenure, and so on and so forth back to the lender. Otherwise, if they're, if they're not in the system, it's going to be not fulfilled. So the lender, after having that information, together with the other things they know about the consumer, such as their credit score, they're going to make the final funding decision. Do I uh, give a loan to this consumer, or do I deny the loan? So you may be wondering, like, what, what's the incentive for employers? You know, why do they do this? Uh, there are a few as a key reasons. One is um, they don't have to do this employment verification anymore. So then they are offloading this uh, burden of having to deal with this uh, uh, lots of requests. And so it saves HR costs. And they also um, can like, be beneficial for consumers who are in the credit market for this type of purposes. OK. So then the key thing we are trying to look at is what's the impact of having this fulfilled verification? So what happens to me as a consumer if my record lives in this database compared to not? Okay, so that's the key question we're going to look at in this uh, research. 
So to answer that question, we're going to use this large data set consisting of 12 million employment verification requests to Equifax in a two-year period from 2016 to 2017. We're going to see uh, whether each request is fulfilled. Is it uh, fulfilled or not fulfilled, depending on the status of the employee on the system. Uh, we're also going to see a range of other characteristics, such as the consumer's credit score. And we see if they are able to get a loan or not. And if so, what is the loan characteristics? And keep in mind that this consumer does uh, live on the more lower credit uh, spectrum. So the average credit score is uh, 606, uh, 568, and that's a lot lower than the general population who has a credit score roughly around like 700 on the average. Okay. And we also see anonymized lev uh, individual level employment record. And importantly, we see the start date, and that's, that's, this is going to be important uh, for the strategy that we're going to utilize, in, which we'll talk about in a bit. OK. So using that, the first thing that we're going to see, just coming from raw data without any models attached to it, is to, it's just to see that among these two groups of consumers, the first group has a fulfilled verification meaning that their record is in the system, so lenders know that they are employed know their income. Compared to the other group, uh, their, uh, their request is not fulfilled. So lenders say that, you know, I cannot really have this digital verification of the employment. So the fulfilled is the green line, uh, which shows the auto loan origination rate against the credit score. And you see the green line is a lot higher than the red line, which is the loan origination rate for consumers without the fulfilled inquiry. There's a very large gap just from eyeballing. And then the gap between the two lines is a lot higher for consumers who are more on the lower credit segment. So this also makes sense because if your credit score is really you know, not bad, you know, if on the far end when we get to the 700, then chances are you're fine, right? So it doesn't matter that much. But if you are really on the low credit segment, that makes a bigger impact. But what's the problem here? So if you think about that is not exactly what you promised me in the beginning. If I just compare these two groups, is that a fair comparison on the impact of having a digital verification? So this may not be the most fair comparison, and why is that? It's because these two groups can be fundamentally different. If you think about people who live in this uh, red line, the people without a fulfillment status, part of these consumers may be, say, unemployed. Therefore, they can be just in a worse financial situation altogether. And if you compare those consumers, to those where we have a fulfilled inquiry, then they may not be like an apple to apple comparison. Question. Um, just to clarify, you mentioned at the beginning that a third of consumers just don't have a credit score. Are they included in this chart? Did you like code them at like the low end of the spectrum, or is this just for people who have a credit score? Uh, great question. Um, so they are not included on this chart, but for those consumers, you see the exactly same pattern. You see the consumers with no credit score, and if they have fulfilled, they are like here. If not fulfilled, they're like here. The reason we don't have them in the academic paper is because the consumers in those situations can just be vastly different in terms of their situations. So having a credit score um, feels to me uh, is like there you, you kind of have a, their sense of uh, status a bit better. Good question. Okay, uh, any other thoughts? Okay, so given that just comparing these two groups may not, may not be the most fair comparison, what do we do? We then move on to this uh, key strategy we're going to employ to really get at its causal impact of having a digital verification. So we're going to employ situations 
where employers join the system in the middle of the data observation period. So we're gonna look at individuals who have applied for a loan and get this uh, verification request prior to their employer's join. So then because their employer hasn't joined the system yet, the request is not gonna be fulfilled. Right? So their record is not in the system yet, they're not gonna be able to be digitally verified. And we're gonna contrast those consumers with another group of individuals who apply for loan uh, and get inquired after the employers join. So then because uh, the timing of when the loan application happens is after the employer has joined the system, so therefore they can be digitally verified. So then we're gonna employ these two group of consumers and then um, the outcome is gonna be comparing the outcome of these two groups one uh, happened before they joined, one happened after they joined. But they have the same actual employment status. So they both work for the same employer, but the only difference is, um, is my record in the system or not? We are gonna, five minutes, okay. We're gonna utilize uh, 495 employers who joined the system in the middle of our data observation period to put things down more formally, we're gonna use this uh, difference in difference model where we compare the outcome of individuals of these two groups. And with the model, we can control for a bunch of other things, such as the consumer credit score. We also control for employer fixed effect because if you work for, say, the government, that may be very different than some other employer. That's the overall employee financial situation. We also uh, control for year month fixed effect because there can be changes in just the seasonalities and time trend of uh, auto loan origination. Okay, so what do we find? We find this large 12% increase in loan origination. This is a large number because if you compare to the baseline in this group, that's only 35%. So uh, relative speaking, as a 35% uh, increase overall. And this effect is a lot higher among consumers who are in this more deep subprime and subprime segment. So consistent with this overall picture that we, we saw in the beginning. When we look at exactly when does this change happen, we look at this month to month increase in chance of getting a loan six months prior and six months after the, this uh, employer joint event happened. So in, right in the middle, this month zero is the, the month where they joined. And you see this significant <coughs> jump right around the time when they joined the system. So this makes sense because for lenders, all I care about is do I have this record or not? You know, how long you have been there? You know, doesn't really matter to the lenders. Okay, so lastly, we're gonna look at what happens to lenders. So we find this overall profit increase by 20%. The profit impact comes from three dimensions. So to start off, we see that this large origination increase, uh, as we just discussed, and this is beneficial for lenders because now they can increase their loan portfolio. I can I have like a larger customer base we find a very marginal change in the interest rate. Compared to the baseline of 13%, you may think, oh gosh, that's so high. Uh, but still keep in mind, this is a very uh, lower credit segment. So compared to the baseline, the, increase change, uh, the interest rate change of 0.4 is like very marginal. But we do find a higher delinquency rate among these consumers. This is also not super surprising because some of these consumers would not even be able to get a loan without this verification. So among this larger expanded customer base, the average delin delinquency rate is a bit higher. So translating that to dollar term, we find the past due amount is higher by about $227. And taking the three dimensions together, overall lenders still have a higher profit. And this happens because this market expansion effect can dominate this cost coming from a higher delinquency. Okay, 
So to wrap up, we find that this digital verification of employment can significantly increase consumers' access to credit. And uh, moreover, doing so can also benefit the lenders who participate in such program. This is related to a range of other attempts to complement credit score in consumer lending. So for example, the Credit Access and Inclusion Act was first uh, introduced by Congress in 2017. What it does is that it allows lenders to use things like uh, utility bill or phone bill as a part of the loan underwriting process. So the goal is to really expand the credit reach for consumers who may not have like a traditional good credit score. Uh, in terms of private effort, we also see lenders are increasingly seeking to get alternative data. Just in the morning, we were talking about you know, whether they can use social media data, some company looking for digital footprint to really complement what we know about the consumer. The key insight in our paper is that instead of looking for new and fancier data, we can actually extract a lot of value from the existing old-fashioned employment data. But the key is to do so with a digital infrastructure. So this is related to this a broader digital revolution in the lending industry, where consumers are increasingly expecting a fast decision-making process. As other, life, other uh, consumer lives, you know, shopping becomes faster and faster, Sorry, same in the lending in industry. And the lenders can do so with this instantaneous access to the verified data and in a secure way. Uh, so that's all I have for the talk. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions.